do do. Uh, you know, we're a little late getting this one out, folks. Uh, do apologize. Um, this second, this fucking second, what do you call it? Second tier, or what do you call it? The second, the COVID strain. What do you call that? The second. Yeah, yeah. The, wave. The, yeah. I guess you can say. Mm-hmm. Now it's not as deadly because it doesn't hit the lungs, but it's just a head cold. Yes. But you can't treat it like a cold. You know, when you have mm-hmm. a head cold, you take your liquids and your thermosip or your thermoflu or your pill, whatever. It yes. doesn't do anything because it's still, at the end of the day, COVID. Yeah. Oh, my God. I still have it a little bit. I'm, I'm obviously out of the, the the danger zone there. But, my God, I'm 6'2 bit like Chewbacca, and that thing knocked my head off for a week. <laughs> you certainly, I'm going to say, I mean, you, you sound a lot better. Um, than you did the other day. So, yeah, good, good to have you back sort of on the road to recovery, Karen, you know. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and appreciate that. I uh, I put out a message to our listeners that would be delayed with this one because of, you know, obviously the circumstances. Yes. And uh, I want to thank everyone for the night, the emails and the posts that we got wishing me well, and I do appreciate it. And that was all from Trevor. So nobody. <laughs> all, all, all my fake accounts. <laughs> you ungrateful yeah. bastards. We give you this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful movie review podcast. We don't charge you. <laughs> and and you can't even send me a well wish. You bunch of <laughs> ingrates. <laughs> you know what it is, Karen? Uh, the, 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 new, the, just the note. They know how strong you are, and they know you would pull through. They know it would be no problem. They know it would be water off a duck's back. This week, we uh, sadly, we lost a couple of great actors. Paul Savino, yes. Polly from Goodfellas, passed away. Always be Uncle Polly to me. Yeah, I like I like Paul Savino, and mm-hmm. we really should just got word of uh, an underrated actor. I think personally, um, he's in a couple of my favorite films from The Omen, one of the best deaths ever. Mm-hmm. And to Time After Time, and Tron, and Time Bandits, and my little Screen hidden gem, Waxwork. Waxwork's brilliant. I love that. Yeah, Waxwork is fun. I don't think people forget forget about that one. But uh, yeah. David Warner passed. So we're going to be tackling a David Warner film. We're going to pepper that in probably before we hit the Friday 13th franchise. Just because we like to kind of do that. To pay homage to some of the actors that we talked about a few times on this podcast. And David Warner is one of them. Yeah. Uh, so there you have it. Um, so yeah, we'll be, you know, probably next week or something like that. But here we're here to talk about a film that we haven't talked, we wanted to talk about for some time now. It was done a couple of years ago and obviously with COVID and everything like that, they delayed it and they, they felt that the film was good enough. Uh, Blumhouse and Universal and Scott Derrickson felt they had a really nice uh, hidden gem here. And with its early reviews, um, it got spot-on reviews from the screenings. So they decided to wait for about a year to put it out on to the big screen instead of releasing it on streaming service, uh, which it is available now on streaming service. But uh, I'm glad they did because this movie's made $80 million in the U.S., quite a few more million around the world. And on a budget of $20 million, we're here to talk about uh, The Black Phone and... Uh, uh, a little horror gem that I've been waiting to talk about for quite a while. Yep. And Scott Derrickson, we've t- talked about just recently when we talked about uh, Doctor Strange 2. He had his hand involvement in a little bit until he walked away from the project for creative differences. And he went to Sam Raimi, which is fine. Horror director to horror director. Well, Derrickson stayed, Derrickson stayed on with um, Doctor Strange as executive produ- producer. So I don't think there was a big fallout or anything. Yeah, like I said in the last part, I don't think he would do that. You don't want to bite the hand. Mm-hmm. And and at the end of the day, you know, um, I, I, I'm curious what he wanted to do to what we got. Well, I read uh, somewhere that he said that um, he feels more at home making the type of film that the black phone is with a more restrained budget. You know, obviously $20 million is not restrained to me or you, but in, in the context of a you know film making in Hollywood, um, it's quite a tight budget. And he said he's more at home with this type of film as opposed to, you know, the whole Marvel big budget spectaculars. Well, we talked about that with James Wan. Mm-hmm. 
James Wan obviously does more grounded stuff like the Saw franchise, The Conjuring, where he's more in charge, leave me alone, yes. and do my thing. Yes. Ty and West as well with X. Yeah, well, Ty West never really ventured off into... Yeah, that's what, why, though. Well, yeah, most likely I'd give you that. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with them dipping their mm-hmm. their their toes into the into the company pool. Yes. But what I think Juan still goes back. He did all, he did the Fast and Furious, sad passing of Paul Walker while filming yeah. that. It was a hard hard one for him. But he went back to horror. Then he did Aquaman, went back to horror, did Aquaman two, now he's back in horror again. Mm-hmm. So he goes back and forth and it's working well for him. Um I think he's been given more creative control. Where Scott Derrickson is a lot more like Ty West where I think he, at the end of the day, just likes to be in complete creative control. And I totally get that. And, and in, in, some directors work really well in both ways. I think James Wan's done well. I think Sam Raimi's done very well. Yeah. But Scott Derrickson and Ty West, all these guys are a lot more grounded than those mm-hmm. guys. And I think at the end of the day, less is more mm-hmm. with these guys. Where Hollywood wants this big CGI screen, and rightfully so, it's Marvel. They have the right to say that, but but I think Derrickson's more foc- would be more focused on the scares and telling the good story, the darker element, the darker element yes. of where Doctor Strange should have went. Where the story we got, I enjoyed the film, I enjoyed the 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 uh, how with the path it went, but the story was pretty piss poor. Mm. Um, it was a bit of a convoluted so, uh, mess. Yeah, and I think Derrickson just wanted to tell a darker take on yeah. it. But anyways, yeah, Scott Derrickson has always been horror. He started off with one of the Hellraiser films, horrible film. And he uh, then obviously found his footing with Exorcism of, Exorcism of Emily Rose, Sinister, mm-hmm. the very, very underrated um, Deliveries from Evil. Please check it out. And uh, now he's back with uh, The Black Phone. Uh, now, The Black Phone is a little uh, short story put out by Stephen King's kid, Joe Hill. Um, I watched a couple of films that Joe Hill um, is affiliated with. Yeah. And one of them was a movie called Horns. Mm-hmm. Guys, check it out. It's good fun. Daniel Radcliffe. Very dark and edgy. And, and I have the uh, novel ballsy. here. Yeah, it, it's solid. And now this one is a little more grounded. And this is pretty much stripped down from, there's no visual effects here. There's no, it's really character driven. I mean, this is literally a character driven film. Mm -hmm. Um, Before we start this review, this is spoiler filled. Um, This is a new release. So as usual, well, fuck it. You still listen to this. I don't give a shit. (laughs) But we will be giving this away. And it's, uh, it's going to be a different one because the film I got is not the film I thought we were going to get. And that doesn't make it a bad thing. It wasn't. It wasn't for me. Well, we'll see. Well, let's, let's, let's dissect it here. So we got Ethan Hawke plays the grabber. And then you've got a series of other character actors. Um, I will be the first to say the two kids in this, uh, Finney and Gwen played by Mason Thames and Madeline McGraw. Yes. Are, I can't stand children actors. I can't stand them since day one. You've known this through my podcast. I will tell you right now, these two young actors are fucking brilliant. Can I right? Well, I would just like to add to that that I agree with you that the, the two actors playing the two kids, the brother and sister, you know, Finney and his sister, um, are really good and very impressive in the roles. However, I did find the character of the sister totally unrealistic and um annoying and irritating and also the unrealism of her character sort of jarred with me especially with the grittiness of the rest of the story but that you know we can come i to completely that. completely disagree with you i'll come on, on. on this on, fucking this, she, this is, this is think, like an eight-year-old girl who can beat the shit out of boys uh much bigger no, and older come on, than her you're, you're, and, you're fucking and, you what and also that's the whole point and the also whole, no. browbeat um seasoned weathered detectives oh fucking give me a break it, it just jarred for me but well, come, i mean that's petty that is fucking she steals the movie if she wasn't in no, this no, film, her acting I would have turned good. it off. Her acting, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in any way um, 
having a pop at the actress who is very very good i'm talking about the character herself oh fucking completely disagree <laughs> see oh you are completely out uh, if it wasn't for her i probably would have i'm gonna tell you right now and my and i have to say I as well Obi the sister Huck. there's just I, the sister uh, isn't let, really let me, in the story and it's an older sister the original story okay. by hell i don't care i don't care about that <laughs> she steals this movie don't listen to him, everybody. It is such a great little character. And they don't carry it up. They don't, oh yeah, she's got the sixth sense, blah, blah. They really don't play on it that much. It's done in a way where it's, it's she's got her mom's, you know, her, her mom had this power, supposedly, where she can see things and predict things and so forth, causing the mother to go crazy and kill herself. ESP, yeah. So the father, who is played beautifully by Jeremy Davies, the father's very good. Yeah, the the the, the act, the family dynamic, and there's this. Anyways, so Gwen has this kind of this ability. Um, she doesn't use it all the time, but she's having these dreams where she can kind of see uh, bits and pieces of the kidnapper. So she tries to help the police. That's where you're kind of going with it. Mm-hmm. But the, at the end of the day, this isn't a horror film. But you, you pepper in that element, it gives you that fantasy horror kind of element to it. I, I actually, and, I mean, we'll come to it. I actually think that the supernatural elements in it are the weakest points of it. And it should have, should although obviously, the, the, you know, the source material has supernatural elements, but they're more restrained. Um, I actually um, think the, the strongest parts of this film are the more grounded, gritty, um, realistic sort of thriller elements. All right. Well, without those elements that you don't like, you wouldn't have that. I, I thought. I thought there. I thought the stuff, the supernatural, natural elements. I think they should have been included in the, um, because they're in the original, um, you know, short story. But I think they should have been more subtle and more restrained. Like maybe just a, a voice on the phone, you know, that sort of thing, as opposed to you know, you actually see the sort of ghosts of these kids, the previous victims. I just think it, 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 it should have been handled more subtly, the supernatural elements. No, I did. Well, we'll get to that. And um, now you're not going to knock, knock, you know, we're going to be kicking each other's ass here. Knocking horns. <laughs> yeah, big time. All right. So the whole introduction of this family and of Finn and Gwen is beautifully set up. Even in the beginning when he's pitching, he's mm-hmm. uh, playing some uh, um, Little League and he's going up against Bruce. Yes. And what I liked about it, it got rid of the cliches. Mm-hmm. Where, oh, I'm going to kick your ass and blah, blah, blah. They don't really focus on that. Like when Bruce hits a home run off him, he actually walks up to him and goes, and him. you know, yeah, nice job. You almost got me. Mm-hmm. You know, your arm is mint, which will come back mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the film. He was a nice kid. And obviously he's the one who gets kidnapped yes. first. And it was just a good dynamic. And there's a scene that broke my heart where, and I still tear up. The flashback? And Gwen, because she, she's a lovely child, Gwen. She's just a good kid. And she always takes up for her brother where Finney is more reluctant. Mm-hmm. He's not a bad guy. He's a guy who can take a hit and get back up, but he's, he's more not reserved. one to fight back. Like when Gwen, he's more he's timid. his ass kicked, and Gwen takes a rock and pummels the bully in the head. It was fucking awesome. But she gets her ass kicked, too, mm-hmm. by the bullies. <laughs> I don't, what, what? I don't get why you. Why are you laughing at that? Uh, Please, why? I don't get. So she, a girl, can't pick up a rock. And no, no, absolutely. No, I mean, it was just a bit sort of. It felt a bit contrived. Uh, no, it's not. The whole point is that she's the one who's willing to fight back to figure things out where he's not, mm-hmm. and that's why when he gets kidnapped, he needs the help of these ex, these uh, ex, you know, these uh, victims, these dead children, who I think are technically in purgatory at the moment. Yeah who are trying to, to push him in the right direction yes. because he doesn't have Gwen. Mm-hmm. So this whole setup is perfect. Okay. Oh, I, Trevor, I, I, Trevor. I will accept Trevor. your take on it. Oh, Trevor, no, no, Trevor. No, no, I, I will accept your take on it. I just, uh, as, as I say, the young actress I felt was, um, you know, very strong in the role. And I just, it was just a bit, it jarred okay. with me. That's okay. I, it, it was just, Hitler, Hitler. <laughs> uh, it, it just did. Uh, you know, I, I, it just didn't. 
See, the thing is, throughout the film, well, certainly in the beginning, those you know, sort of early scenes in, in the school and stuff with the fight and all, which is br- which are brutally violent. Um, I have to say, I'm very gritty and grounded. Oh, I love when Robin beats the shit out of Moose. That was oh, awesome. he's brilliant. Yeah, uh, he's a good character. Yeah, uh, he was such a, a likable sort of badass kid. You know, he, yeah. he was bad. You know, and I, I love how he could do the kung fu. You know, like Bruce Lee, because obviously the Bruce Lee films were really big then and stuff. You know, yeah, they talk so it ties about that. In with yeah. that, you know, and he was such a cool character because he, although he was a badass and a tough kid, he also had a heart. You know what I mean? And he also, yes. you know, was loyal to his friends and stuff. And he wasn't. He wasn't a bully. You know what I mean? He was just a, a, a tough kid. I don't. I mean, like I say, I, I mean, like there's certain scenes um, with the going back to the, the sister. Um, I just, I just found him a bit too hard to accept. I mean, the, like the bit where she's like um, having a pop at Jesus. You know what I mean? Um, that was just a bit too silly. There's nothing wrong with that. He brings religion into his films quite a I bit. Get, I get that. Exorcism. I get that. I, I just found it seemed a bit implausible at times. Uh, Impossible! It's a fucking horror film. No, but, but the, the thing is, but the tone—it's grounded there's mixed, horror. There's film a mixed, peppered there's mixed in tones here with the little fantasy. That's what this yes, is. Yes, but there's mixed tones, um, and I preferred it whenever it was doing the more um, gritty, sort of much more believable tone, like the stuff with you know um, the bullies and oh, stuff. Oh, but the supernatural part—that's believable. It, well, well, I think it should have been more subtle. You know, I here's here's. I'll, I'll give you a second. I would have if accepted fucking, the supernatural you, I'm gonna, stuff. You know I'm going to talk. I know it. I'm getting mad at you. Now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But listen. Okay. I've seen this film three mm-hmm. times. All right. And I just finished watching it again. Yes. And this scene breaks my heart when, and I get choked up even talking about it. When the dad, now, first of all, the dad, excuse me. I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not crying. <laughs> I got the I, I, tell I, I the truth, damn, Kieran. Tell the fucking cold. Bullshit. You're so, crying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, when the dad finds out um, that the cops are approaching her. I know what scene you're talking about. And it, 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 uh, because, it is extremely powerful. Because, yes, because of when she's tell, she's, she, she sees black balloons. Yes. The police have never released this before, and they want to know how she knows. Well, she tells him about she dreams it like her mom used to. Yes. So the father beats her with the belt. Yeah, it's a brutal scene. Like it is a horrible scene. I tear up when I see it because this girl. I see that scene and and the father sell it. Oh yeah, beautifully. That is by far the um, young actor. I mean, she totally she she is the young actress and the father. Um, but the young actress in, in particular is so believable, and it's such a powerful. See, this is the, the gritty, realistic tone that I. There's a bit of a mix. There's a bit of a sort of. Um, it's like a sort of. There's a lack of balance with the tone at times. I disagree. I completely disagree with you on this. I don't get. I'm shocked that you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Yes, no, but that is because, the, is an extremely powerful and very realistic scene. But you know what? What lends so much weight to it. Um, as well, and you don't find out this this out until later on, is that the father, although he's being a bastard and he's wrong in what he's doing, obviously, um, there are he has his reasons. He, uh, uh, oh yeah, that's my point. His, uh, he's his own not sort of a work. bad man. Yes, yes, hundred percent. And that is such uh, brilliantly written. It's it, it it's it is the believe it or not the most powerful scene in the film. Yes, and it becomes and even more yeah, powerful well, there's, there's, later there's, on whenever you find out his scene. reasons for doing it. And, yeah, when you find out, it's because his daughter has this ability. And it's not because, He's trying to protect because her. his mom had the ability. And the problem is, is that the mother took her life because of yes, it. Yes, he's she trying to protect the daughter. She, he's just trying to protect her from not doing what her mom ended up doing. In a warped, in his warped sort of alcohol-fueled way. and He's, di- he's depressed. Yes. He's down. It's such... It's one of those things that you're not. You're not. When it happens, you feel sorry for both of them. I, you don't. Feel, you're not like you. You bastard. You, you're not like. It's, it's just. I can't explain. Well, it. well. At it's first, just, at first, um, while I found it totally believable, at first it was like it was you bastard. But then you find out later on why he was doing it to protect his daughter in, in this warped sort of way. And you, you, yeah, then, then yeah. on rewatch, you then think. Then you feel sorry for the both of them. But yeah, it's a very, very powerful scene. And absolutely bang on acting. 
um, by the young girl. Um, and the it's a nice little. I like, uh, and we're not even into the horror part yet. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a nice film because the first the first act is more about family dynamic and setting it up and children. Yeah, you know, bullies and it, it kind of sets up the the atmosphere that we're in currently. I love the co- and the, the second color act is use, more of um, you know, especially in those early scenes. You know, um, it's that grim and grimy nineteen seventies look. You know, um, brilliantly sort of shot and sort of you know cinematography and stuff. You know, yeah. you really think you're and, back in time in the seventies. Yeah, exactly. It's in the fall, so it's the leaves are gone. It's kind of dirty yes. look to it. Um, and then the second act would be him, you know, being imprisoned. Mm-hmm. But the first act, there's a great scene when Robin, the guy who, who protects Finn, when the bullies are going to beat him up in the bathroom, mm-hmm. and Robin comes in after beating yeah. the shit out of Moose, and he wipes his blood mm-hmm. from his knuckles. <laughs> And he goes, God, Moosey's got some sharp teeth. <laughs> uh, and he's watching. And he goes, Can I help you guys? <laughs> and right there, the intimidation factor was brilliant. Mm-hmm. And it sucked because he gets kidnapped. Yes. And, and killed. He doesn't make it, obviously. But what what sucks is, you almost wish. I don't know that there was some way he escaped or something. Yeah, because he's, he's such a likable character. character. Yeah, exactly. Um. But I love when the girl calls the cops, you dumb fucking fart knockers. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I, I found that hard to buy. Um, You know, these are like... I will say that it's a little out of character, yeah, it's, a little out of place for a dark film. Yeah, it was just a bit sort of... It just sort of, again, it took me out of it a bit. Um, But keep in mind, keep in mind, she's, she's a child. Mm. And she's... uh. So she she comes up with the cops and she calls them a dumb fuck you know mm-hmm. dumb fucking fart knockers yeah. and have I'm having a laugh at their expense. But this is before before her brother Finn gets kidnapped. Yes. So when once he's kidnapped, mm-hmm. she pulls it back. Mm-hmm. She's a lot more reserved, depressed, mm-hmm. and trying to figure this out and 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 pushing for her dreams to come through to give some kind of clue to where he could be. Mm-hmm. So I kind of think they did that. She said, yeah, she's kind of a smart-ass, Annie-esque kind of type character. You know, I can handle the best. I can hang, I can hang, I can hang with the best of them mm-hmm. kind of attitude. But that's taken away from her once Finn is kidnapped. Mm-hmm. So I think they did that deliberately. It might have not worked, but I think that was the reason for them doing that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's fair enough, yeah. Well, that was pretty intelligent of me. I, I got to give myself. No, I mean, that one. The, the, that's um, for, uh, yeah, I would, I would tend to agree with that. Um, while there were reasons for doing it, that um, it didn't really, it didn't really pull it off. You know that now, that that part, uh, that, that part. Yeah, that's fair enough. Now, what I don't get, these cops have got to be fucking stupid, because it seems like a pretty small town, and all these kids, kids are getting kidnapped. The guy's got a big black van. I just don't get why they haven't caught him. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it, it is a bit sort of yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, this was these were in the days before the internet and stuff, but still, surely they would have checked who's got a black van registered, you know, with I don't know car dealers or whatever. Not unless the killer, uh, I don't know, bought it in a different state or something, and it wasn't registered. I don't know, but yeah, it's pretty obvious. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's a big black van. I mean, the black van itself is a reference to Ted Bundy. I mean, there's there, there's quite a few references to various serial killers here, especially John Wayne Gacy, um, who in the 1970s, I can't remember the state in America, but um, he was basically doing what the grabber was doing. Um, he was actually um, kidnapping and raping and murdering young boys and, and had them in, in the cellar. Um, it's fucking heavy stuff, like real like um, dark stuff. Yeah, I don't think he was raping him in this one, but yeah. Not in this. And uh, in this, it is heavily suggested that he is that he's a pedophile. Well, let me know when those scenes come because I'm curious. What? Because I got a couple questions coming yes. up here. So we're introduced to the grabber. Yes. Um, and this is going to be a sore, a sore, sore spot for me. Mm-hmm. Now I like Ethan Hawke. Great actor. Uh, I yes, I really enjoy his stuff. This is nothing against him. Yes. However. I don't know how to take the character. I wasn't that threatened by him. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it seemed to be... He seemed to be less intimidating. That's the perfect word. 
where I, I almost want to see, um, what's his name? Oh, for fuck, you'll know this one in a heartbeat. Ted Levine's character from Silence yes, of the Buffalo Lambs. Bills. And I think Buffalo Bill. I, I almost wanted to see a buff I wanted to see a Buffalo Bill kind of character where this guy's a little more yes. reserved. He's certainly no Buffalo Bill. Um uh, in the in the original short story, he's actually more of he doesn't wear a mask for a start, and he's more of like this sort of fat, sort of creepy, pervy sort of looking guy. Um and this obviously, you know, Ethan Hawke's sort of buffed up you know he's quite buff uh yeah i mean i think he's quite a good actor but he's just nowhere near as memorable as the likes of ted levine's buffalo bill um or the likes of that you know he's uh, he's good and you know he he i mean i, and I do like ethan hawk um in all of his films but he's just um yeah there was something missing wasn't there yeah, there was, I like the mask, and I like how he can turn the frown upside mm-hmm. down and stuff like that. He can interchangeable. I just don't think he... And I don't think it's his fault. I think it's the material mm-hmm. that he's given. And that's completely Scott Derrickson's fault when he probably told him, hold back a bit, hold well, back. He seems to have, I don't yeah, think he, he seems to have different facets. Well, he does have different um, facets of his personality, um, which are sort of represented by the, the, the different ways he wears the mask. You know where he removes parts of it and stuff. I mean, yeah. Well, the mask—you got the frowny face, you got the yeah. smiley face, uh, but also his tone. Mm-hmm. If you if you listen to him, he sounds like Ethan Hawke. But if you ask him, if the kid asks him a question that he's uncomfortable with, he turns like Batman. That deep. I think I think it's again suggested that there's some sort of split personality going on here, or some sort of personality defect where he has you know multiple personalities or whatever, um, because there are different sides to him. Um, you know, where there's the more softer sort of, um, you know, tone, and then there's the more threatening one and stuff. I just don't think it was. I think I would have liked to seen more about it, and I think I would would have liked them to go into it a bit more, like they did with Buffalo Bill, um, in the Silence of the Lambs, and um, you know, and even though Buffalo Bill isn't in the Science of the Lambs that much when he is in it, you find out so much about his character in those sort of scenes that he is in, you know, for example whenever he's doing the famous, you know, cock between the legs um, dancing scene and, you know, and, you know, other bits, but, yeah I mean, to be honest I I don't think anyone's gonna fucking be as good as um, Ted Levine as Buffalo Bill, (laughs) you know Well, you know, and I'm not comparing apples to oranges but at least Silence of the Lambs, you had like a it's a pop oiler mm-hmm. with him with that character, and then this one, I never had any intensity when he comes down the stairs or anything. No so, proper threat. Uh, there was no build up. Mm-hmm. Even the scene where he's given the lock code and he's trying to sneak out, even there was no tension there. Mm-hmm. And that team should have been reaming of tension yes. in that scene when he's trying to escape. Mm-hmm. Should have been all, all on the edge of your seat type I, thing. Because there's. His whole thing, and this is what we find out from Billy, the, first, the one of the ghosts, the, one of the dead kids who calls him on the mm-hmm. phone. He tells him, don't go up, because he leaves the door unlocked on purpose. Mm-hmm. Because if you go up on that door when it's unlocked, he will beat you for trying to yes. escape. That's what he wants. He wants to play this cat and the mouse game. The naughty game. The naughty game. So that could be your pedophile thing, the naughty but there, game. No, but there's also um, the, the, the pedophile thing. There's also um, a scene where Finney um, wakes up and the guy, um, you know, the grabber, says, um, I, 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 was, I just want to sit and look yeah. at you. Yeah, I remember that scene. Yeah. And um, I think uh, it's, I mean, I'm pretty certain it's, it's um, you know, it's it's heavily suggested, although it's restrained, um, you know, it's not gratuitous. And, and, and the short story, this guy's a, a pedophile as well. Okay. Yeah, I didn't but it, but, but it's well handled. It. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. suggested. It's not gratuitous, and because you don't, it just has to be suggested. You don't have to, you know, it'd be well, well for a start. Um, the audience should be treated with respect anyway, in that you know they're not stupid and they can work it out for themselves. But also, you know, people, you know, I certainly don't want to see fucking graphic scenes of that nature. Um, you know, um, so yeah, I mean. I, I can get the clues, you know what I mean? And I'm happy enough with just the clues, you know? I, I do like the redemption Robin and him have mm-hmm. when he gets these phone calls from these kids. And each call, each kid gives them a clue on how to how they tried to escape. And, and he uses them um, all. And he uses them all, like the cord, mm-hmm. um, and try to pull the window down. Yes. He only the gets meat, the grain the down. with the dog. And, uh, yeah, he tells them to 
try to get through the meat locker by doing this, and all he could get is seize the meat. But he still uses it. And then yeah. you see, yeah, my, no, you know, let me. So when he, and then he's told to dig a hole, mm-hmm. and all these stuff that all these kids tried to do to escape, but never, nothing mm-hmm. came of it. Obviously, they were killed. But the ending is brilliant when Robin finally tells Finny, you need to fuck, you need to fucking fit, stick up for yeah. yourself. He goes, you're a fighter. And what I mean by he goes, what do you, I mean by a fighter? You'll take the hit and get back up, but you need to fight back and you need to do it now. It was a great character journey for, for Finny. Or- yes, I, I, we, we talk about arcs and I love his arc yeah. because he tells him, put the, you know, uh, and then he stands uh, up for himself. Vince tells him, but, yeah. So he says, everything that you tried to escape with, use it. Yes. And I didn't catch on to that, that he sets up a trap. Mm-hmm. I didn't see that coming. Believe it or not, I did not see or, it coming. Uh, who I haven't mentioned yet is one of my fucking favorite characters in it. The fucking, the cokehead brother of the grabber. Yeah, Max, <laughs> the twist. Yeah, the red herring. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's Rans, uh, James Rams, Ra- uh, Ransom. He's he's in all, a lot of yes. uh, Derrick's mm-hmm. films. He's in Sinister and Sinister 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, when they show up and he's on coke and he's, <laughs> he's like, I do like the fact that he's got this map and it's, he's telling the cops he's, this is the location he has to be in. Yeah. And they're like, okay, this guy's not the killer. He's not. This guy's a hit. See yes, yeah. And there's a scene where Max is sitting on the couch and he's sitting and he's looking at the map and he realizes yeah. it's his own mm-hmm. house. Mm-hmm. And he realizes that his brother, played by obviously Ethan Hawke, is the grammar. Yeah. Uh, that was nice. Uh, that was nice. Little twist. I liked the ending because the twist came with he was in his brother's basement, but they kind of play it where maybe he's not in the basement. He's in the house across the street. Mm-hmm. But there's two houses. But there's two houses. He's burying them in the house across the street, mm-hmm. and he's killing them in the house. Yes. Um, and so Max was in the house all the time. I thought that was a red herring. I thought they're going to say he was in the basement, but I thought they were in the house across the street. But he was. Yeah, I, I love that Max shot was in the- where the police called around and he's all manic, full of coke and all, and he's saying, you know, he's like this sort of almost like conspiracy nothing. And the cops can't wait to get out. Say, yeah, this guy's crazy. And then uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they say to him, "Oh, by the way, you might want to tidy up." Um, when people are calling around or words to that effect, and he. he they like nod down and you, you see his sort of coke there so anyway he goes oh shit and he gets down and snort a line of coke and the camera pans down onto the floorboards and that's when you realize um he's the brother um who is called and he is actually in the house of the grabber yeah yeah uh, yeah exactly and and well also with gwen has the dreams when she has that dream about, about vance mm-hmm. the badass who, who gets who was killed who calls him eventually mm-hmm. She, um, she has this you see this flashback of Vance playing pinball yeah. whatever and uh, yeah. he carves 7741 into this kid's arm I'm like what the fuck yeah. and then you find out it's Gwen having this flashback mm-hmm. slash Dream. out of body experience yeah. of what happened to Vance mm-hmm. and 7741 is the house number yes. mm-hmm. and um, he was although he was a bit over the top you know this, um, he, he was obviously, you know, he looked a bit like sort of Roger, um, Roger Daltrey and of the Who and stuff, and you know, uh, he, he, he what, what was it? He kept saying, he goes, uh, he, well, he kept swearing or something like, "Get the fuck out of here!" What the fuck are you asking me? You know, it's like it's a bit over the top, but he was quite a sort of a very Stephen King esque character. I mean, this is full of Stephen S Stephen King esque characters. Well, very Stranger Things. Yeah, they're better very that Stephen too. King, Spielberg. It reminded me of Billy in eight. Stranger Things. I thought it was more of uh, what's his name, uh, the new one that everyone loves. I can't I'm only on He's season three season. now. Oh, I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, so she finds out where the house. If you figure out the seven seven four one, because he carved it in, in the uh, in the arm, she kind of figures it out. Um, but as this is all going down. Now, now you think these kids are in purgatory because there's a line that one of them says, I think it's Vance, I can't remember which one, when he calls Finn on the phone and says, we need you to get out of here, you need to get out of here. So I think they're in purgatory, Yeah, that, that's it, but, but yeah, like purgatory, limbo type thing, and that they'll not be properly at rest until, you know, well, they're discovered, but in the meantime, they're going to try and help Finny. No, it's like the, the, their souls can't rest until they're they're discovered and, and they get like a proper yeah. burial type thing. Oh, yes, that makes sense. Yeah, because they find their bodies in the other house. Yeah. 
So when the when the cops go to the to Max's house, well, the brothers their house, yes. um, they're looking around and stuff, and they find the basement where the bodies are buried. Yeah. At the same time, across the street, they're having the big showdown, mm-hmm. and though I liked how he set him up with all the traps, mm-hmm. put in the crate in the hole, so he'll tri- to trip on the hole, break his break his foot by falling into the crate that's in the hole, and taking the cord and strangling with it, and then he hear the line, "Your arm is mint, your arm is a mint." Yeah. He knows to break his mm-hmm. neck with the cord, the phone cord yes. that is. Mm-hmm. He uses the cord from well, well, breaking the window to trip him as well. You know, packed with dirt. Yeah, receiver. So to trip him, yeah. Then he tripped, and then he has a mad dog, mm-hmm. and he didn't. And now he realizes, oh, the steaks from the freezer. You give it to the mm-hmm. dog, um, so he can walk out. He walks out, and there's a sister across the street. And you know, we talk about character arcs and all that's a lot, and this has them all. Um, I'll tell you what, I love the father. It was a good moment when the father shows up and sees them and yeah. he apologizes yeah. to both of them. That and, was really, um, that end, was a really good, um, sort of, you know, br- br- bringing the father's arc full circle, you know, yeah, exactly. himself. And, exactly. Well, they all did yes. really. And then when like Finn, like Finn at the end, his redemption, he's walking through the halls with a big grin on his face he's just, and he's talking to the girl he likes who he never would in the first place because now people aren't going to fuck with him. Yeah. He's kind he's of a of hero. Age. He's come of age. He's found himself. Yeah. His confidence is back. And uh, so it, it was bittersweet, actually, what happened Did to him. Did you notice really. as well, whenever the young girl is um, driving around on her bike, it's obviously a huge reference to it. She's wearing a yellow raincoat. Oh, uh, no, I didn't Yeah, she's that. wearing a yellow raincoat like Georgie. Um, another sort of, obviously, you know, Stephen King is the father of Joe Hill, who wrote the original story. And obviously, you know, it is about, you know, a child killer, you know, um, who, who owns balloons. So, yeah, whenever she's like, pedaling around on her bike in the rain, she's wearing a yellow raincoat like Georgie from it, you know, in the films. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Well, I'm pretty peppering a little with his dad mm-hmm. into everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, listen, at the end of the day, the, the first act plays a little better because it's. Lo- I think in some ways it's a little more tension-filled, yes. especially with the family dynamic I agree. than it is actually with the grabber. I agree. I'm much more believable. Um, and that's where the film kind of hurt a little bit. Now, I think the reason this film is doing really, really mm-hmm. well is because it does have that it feel, goony mm-hmm. slash Stranger whatever things, feel yeah. with, with the horror element to it. And I think it all works nicely. However, I'm disappointed on a couple of things. And the two main ones, one's a big one, is the grabber himself. I don't find him as intimidating as he should be, as other villains. And I feel the escape sequence when he picks the lock to run out of the house was stupid because he got out. Mm. He should have got out. That would have been it. I can't see the grabber running out and grabbing him like he did to catch him again. I thought that was a little silly because at the end of the day, if he's gonna, if he escapes and he grabs him and he brings him back in there, he's not just going to throw him in there. If this guy is a murdering pig, he probably would have killed him for doing that. See the thing, yeah. So no. the character, the character is very. I didn't know what to. I don't. What's this guy's intent? I don't understand. What What do you have to do to him for him to kill you? Yes, I know. Because, yeah, it, it is a bit prolonged, you know, with the regarding, you know, if he killed the other kids so quickly or whatever, um, you know, you know, why is he keeping Finney alive? But I suppose it's sort of suggested as well that he's sort of having a sort of, um, some sort of internal crisis where he wants to stop, that sort of thing. But I don't think it's laid out enough that... Although he does say it, I'm thinking about letting you go and stuff to Finney. Um, regarding the escape that you mentioned, um, I have I will totally buy the grabber catching him again. But I agree that um, if you know the grabber should have been really pissed off. The problem with the grabber, while Ethan Hawke does a quite decent job with it, we we'll never really see him lose it properly. To so that we fully, fe- it's like it's a subtle performance, but it's almost too subtle. You know what I mean? Yeah. The problem is, it's too subtle. Like when he killed his brother Max, yes. that should have been terrifying. Yes. It's it's too it restrained. Wasn't. So it is. Yeah, he was. He should have. And for him trying to escape, yeah. there should have been a. Actually, I'm going to say right now, there should have been a cruel punishment. There, there was no real. Yeah, there was no real menace there. there. He should have really have hurt him, like break his ankle. Yeah, there was no Something real menace to where. You're fucked. Well, well some, some, something because, where, where the audience can say, yeah, this guy's a real fucking threat here. Uh, so it was almost like 
um, Hawk is a bit too restrained, um, you know, um, for us to be properly on board uh, and to be, well, basically for the audience to be afraid of this guy, you know. Yeah, and despite and despite this big flaw, and it's a big mm-hmm. one to be fair. The movie works because he's already built this great dynamic of people mm-hmm. that we all are kind of rooting for. I, I found him. So I, I found him at his most sinister and the, the actual kidnapping scene where he grabs Finney. You know where he's saying, "I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fucking magician." Do you want to see a magic trick? That's a probably his scurriest scene, so to speak. You know what would have been cool if the character had some kind of weird trait, like mm-hmm. he'd come down and do a magic show for the mm-hmm. kids. But you don't know if something, and it's but it's really disturbing. Yeah, yeah. something really just creepy. And that some kind of been much more creepy than actually seeing the physical manifestations of the kids. I I personally uh, think it would have worked worked better if you just heard the kids' voices on the phone and you didn't actually see their ghosts. I've their, their ghosts took away and jarred with me a little. From I disagree from with that. I like home because you get you're giving a face to it. Mm-hmm. Now I know he tried to do flashbacks with each one so you can kind of see what they look like in their mm-hmm. past lives, whatever. And, but I like seeing, and he doesn't throw them at you. They're hidden in the corner. I know. You really I don't know. see their face that much. So I kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the flashbacks, so, and just their voices would have worked just for me. All right. Well, to be thrown. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, these horror films that are coming out lately are a lot smarter and better than this, this trash yeah. we used to get. Thanks to films like this, whether you like it or not, they're giving horror films a better name. A better reputation. Um, exactly. With movies like X, which is getting rave reviews. This one's getting mm-hmm. rave reviews. The Scream, The Halloweens, mm-hmm. uh, Malignant. All these films that are coming out, they're getting a massive audience. They cost 10 to $20 million to make, mm-hmm. and they're quadrupling in that easily. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the new producers off these they're taking old school uh, artists' yes. work, like Carpenter and uh, so forth, and tweaking what worked for them and put peppering in the little modern day, you know, edge to them, and it's working. Mm-hmm. And this is one of them. Now, I'm not saying how do I put this? I really liked it, but I wanted something a little different. I yeah, I, I, I will say I, that I I, I I liked yeah. I, I would pretty much agree with her. I did like it myself. And I I found it um, very well done with certain aspects. The, uh, however, I was left wanting a bit more. But also, I did feel that it had its flaws at times, um, which did jar with me. But overall, I would uh, I would certainly give it a pass. And um, and I did like I do like it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just I, I suppose in my head, I I would have preferred it done. A different way, but I mean, what the fuck do I know? I'm just a viewer, you know what I mean? But, you know, some things work for me, um, but I suppose, overall, it, yeah, I'll give it a pass. Yeah, and if we get anything out of this, these two young actors are going to have a career, that's Well, for they sure. certainly deserve to, um, based on they, this. Uh, they, 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 they nailed it out of the park, both of them, and uh, there you go. That's it, that's a wrap on The Black Phone. Yeah. Um, give us a shout on Facebook or on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, Instagram is at Citizen Frame underscore podcast. And of course, Facebook. Always give us a shout out about what you thought of it, uh, especially a new release. Feedback it's available is on welcome. video. It's a, it's a, um, it's on video on demand now. Mm-hmm. So it's available. Be on Blu ray and 4K real soon. And uh, check it out. Uh, it's definitely worth the watch. I, everyone, you'll enjoy it. There's no hatred on this film. Um, but, uh, it works overall. Yeah. There are elements of it that didn't work for me personally, but overall, I think it's yeah, yeah. And um, we're gonna end this one. Uh, like I said in the beginning of the podcast, we're gonna do maybe a David Warner one, and then we will hit the Friday Thirteenth retrospective. Um, have a little fun with that one. Thanks for your patience, guys. We'll try to get back on track here. Um, Say, so fight this stupid bug. And, and get well uh, soon to Kieran. Yeah, you're the only one who said that. <laughs> Nobody cares about me. Send him your love. Uh, you know what I mean? Never mind uh, the film. Send him. Kieran your fuck love. Fuck him. I don't care anymore. <laughs> I don't want to hear about you, what you liked and what you didn't like anymore. You're all dead to me. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. We're out of here. Have a good one.